We talk a lot about how many of the stunts in George Miller's Mad Max Fury Road were shot practically. It gives the film a kind of maverick street cred with film fans and pushes back against that same group's favorite 21st century blockbuster complaint that everything nowadays is indistinguishable CGI mush. But why do we care? And what does shot practically mean for a film like Mad Max Fury Road? The making of Mad Max Fury Road on a technical level is nearly a larger part of its own cultural story than that of the film itself. Behind the scenes video showing some of the sequences from Fury Road without their later enhancements via CGI demonstrates how many of the film's complex and deeply layered visuals were grounded in location photography, practical stunts, and physical effects. And he managed to not only capture them, but he captured them with a very limited amount of CGI. Fury Road was sold, at least in part, on this assertion that George Miller and his team had done it all for real. So it's completely real. But 20 seconds viewing of the finished work easily proves how feathery our dividing line between real and not real is. Or more accurately, between what we consider permissible CGI, color correction, digital compositing, the occasional flaming tornado, and fake CGI, elaborate future cityscapes, the bad guy in any given Fantastic Beasts movie, and superheroes in general. The irony, of course, is that Mad Max Fury Road has been somewhat, if not largely, digitally manipulated in just about every frame and shot. But the film's reliance on as many practical effects and stunts as possible under excruciatingly harsh filming conditions was a line in the proverbial and physical sand. What is it? It's a detour. The grand subtext of the making of Fury Road that what you're seeing happened in front of the camera ties beautifully to the grand subtext of Fury Road as a film as well. The film is about the bodies of its characters as much as or more than it is about their minds or their will. Their bodies have been monetized, commercialized, and made into product. Immortan Joe has built his citadel in the desert on more bodies than we can count. And the story of the film is built on one of those groups of bodies making their escape, no longer willing to be used as Joe's breeding stock. But every shot of Mad Max Fury Road has been changed using computers. Some of these are very simple. No desert or sky on our planet looks like the citron and teal wasteland in the first shot of the film, for example. And others are the digital equivalents of older movie tricks. The interceptor flips as Immortan Joe's goons are chasing it, setting a record for a practical car stunt. But when it settles to a halt, there is an unsubtle digital morph to a similar shot of Tom Hardy as Max clawing his way out of its wreckage. We care about this less than we claim to. Or more specifically, perhaps we have an unease with the concept of digital imagery that isn't actually connected to its prevalence in any given picture, but rather to the narrative around it and our own contentedness with the final result. Notoriously, Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was one of the biggest practical model shows of its era, but was dismissed as computer-generated garbage thanks to the presence of Jar Jar Binks and George Lucas's insistent branding that his prequel trilogy would usher in the age of digital cinema. You know, we're pushing the envelope in a few places. Hopefully it'll work. Which it did. You're so might be saying that. Only a handful of years later, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy made equivalent use of miniatures and models, but featured a fully CGI character who was warmly embraced by audiences, unlike Jar Jar Binks. Mad Max Fury Road was released in 2015, the same year a Star Wars sequel reversed course on George Lucas's branding by foregrounding how many models, puppets, and practical effects were used in the making of The Force Awakens. I think for JJ, the first priority is let's shoot it practically. Any random 20 seconds in the finished product capably demonstrate what kind of hogwash that assertion was, but then so do any random 20 seconds of Mad Max Fury Road. 
But there is something about stunts in particular, I have to admit, where the limbic response is simply different if you have any awareness that what you're seeing may have been carefully planned and executed by dedicated craftspeople as a for real event, even if that event had to be substantially massaged in the computer later. The latter Mission Impossible movies have rebuilt their entire brand around gamely trying to kill Tom Cruise every two years. And just as computer-generated imagery has improved by leaps and bounds since Jar Jar Binks, so too have the technological crafts surrounding practical effects. So, for example, if you want to set off the biggest tanker explosion in cinema history, the definition of biggest is actually bigger now than it could ever safely have been 20 years ago. And the result is so spectacular that we don't really mind a green-screened Tom Hardy swinging through the foreground of the frame. There is something worrying about the idea that practical magic has to be sold to audiences as an authenticity principle in an era where computer manipulation is endemic in nearly every image we witness. I say this only because emphasizing the practical draws the audience's eye away from what should be a basic aspect of our 21st century media literacy, that we have to interrogate the realness of everything we see. Seeing is disbelieving. Maybe Mad Max Fury Road acknowledges that paradox by approaching it in reverse. Tactile, hair-raising, unfakeable stunts that you can feel in the pit of your stomach. You can't believe your eyes, but trust your gut.